you so much for coming. Um, obviously, with uh, the snow today, um, a lot of folks made Herculean efforts to get out and over here today. Uh, for those of you at home, um, I, I hope it's hope this has been a good day for you. Uh, Kevin Martin it, it deserves the intrepid uh, uh, person of the war, uh, day today for getting out of his uh, his his neighborhood. Um, Maggie is in Maggie Reardon is the senior writer for CNET and CBS Interactive. Maggie's covered these issues for, for a long time. She's now in Philadelphia, um, and she had some travel delays. Um, but Maggie's going to do this, this, this zero rating panel for us uh, remotely. So we'll do that. If we have trouble with the connection, um, we'll just we'll kind of continue the conversation. And I may help with if Q&A if that's not possible for Maggie, um, being able to see everybody. So with that, let me leave it to Maggie Reardon. Maggie, just give us one second. Okay, that, that's always... It's always encouraging. Mm -hmm. So Maggie, we're, we're still not hearing you, but um, uh, just give us a few minutes. Why don't, why don't I do this, since I am totally unprepared for this particular zero writing panel. Um, does anyone give, anybody want to give us, let me, let me introduce uh, Roz Layton um, from, uh, uh, you flew in from Copenhagen via Florida. Um, next to you is Kevin Martin, former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, now with Facebook and Internet.org. And next to you is Barbara Vancevic from Stanford University. And did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Great, great. Um, and they, they have graciously offered their time. We have on the uh, online, we have um, Jorge Vargas from Wikipedia or Wikimedia Foundation, um, and he's here from Mexico City. So maybe what we can do is, uh, maybe if I can ask, since we can't... Uh, you may need to ask her on mute for microphone. Maggie, can you unmute? Okay, we had we had this working an hour ago. I apologize, Maggie. Just bear with me, okay? Okay. Oh, oh there you are. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay, I think we can hear you, Maggie. Okay. All right. Terrific. Um, so here we go. So we we've got the introductions underway. Let me let me just sort of talk a little bit about set the stage for this panel. Uh, So-called zero rating plans and offers have been gaining a lot of steam here in the U.S. and abroad. Um, the services are often called toll-free data because they offer content at reduced rates or at attractive, ter at attractive terms. For instance, the service um, may not count against a wireless data cap. Three of the four major wireless carriers in the U.S. have recently introduced uh, zero rating plans, and supporters of net neutrality, are, especially here in the U.S., are concerned about this. They think that it is a violation of principles uh, that keep the internet open, whereas a lot of the ISPs say, no, this is uh, a, a new kind of business that we're running here. So uh, we've got a terrific panel uh, who's well-versed in these areas, and I think we're going to have a great discussion. So let me just uh, kick this off. I'm going to um, ask a bunch of questions, and then at the end, we'll have some time for audience uh, questions as well. So let me start with uh, Rosalind. Um, Zero rating is not a new concept, so uh, it's been around for a long time. Explain how it's worked in other industries, and, and why are we um, concerned about it now? So, uh, well, first I just want to recognize the state of the net people for their Hercule Herculean effort to get us here, and also their very kind uh, effort to work with Uber to zero rate a taxi ride to, uh, to get me here today, so thank you so much for that. Um, it's absolutely correct. This has been around a long time. Uh, you know, if you think there is really no good or service that you consume in your life that's not subject to a differential price. And so, you know, it's strange to me why we want to single, single this out for, you know, internet service. But, you know, the, what I appreciate being an American who lives in abroad, the most powerful, most wonderful thing about the U.S. is our culture, it's our exports. And how did we create, you know, fund the culture uh, of the United States was we allowed third parties to participate to lower the cost to the end user. So if you think about radio, TV, print, internet, 
one of the best things about the history of that is that we allowed advertisers, sponsors, what have you, to be able to lower the cost to the end user. So key difference between the United States and Europe, when you would watch TV, you didn't have to pay for TV subscription. You just watched television. If you're in many European countries, you have to pay a media license fee. So, you know, what does that mean? You have fewer channels, less content. You know, you will go to jail if you don't pay your media license fee or you get a fine. So one of the, you know, one of the important things about this sort of model is that it increases the participation uh, of many people who can enjoy different content and it allows the content providers to get involved in different ways. So, I mean, you know, if you look at it, all of the business models of the internet companies are employing some kind of a third party subsidization. So, for example, uh, Google zero rates its search by having ads also being shown. So I guess what I would say is this is it's definitely not new. Um, these kinds of um, things, whether it's a freemium, loss leader, uh, advertising supported, this has really been around to you know the, the founding of media itself. So Barbara, I want to pose this question to you. I mean, this isn't simply about advertising, right? I mean, uh, how is this different from sort of an advertising model and and why are we talking about it now in terms of the wireless industry? Why is that important? Yeah, so the key reason we are talking about it now is because um, zero rating is one of the questions that the FCC did not address or explicitly address in its open internet rules. And so while it adopted certain so-called bright line rules to deal with technical forms of discrimination, it left forms of economic discrimination, including zero rating, to the general conduct rule. And as if they were out to sort of explore the boundaries of the gray areas that the FCC's open internet order left, we have seen a proliferation of zero rating plans in the past couple of months. And that has really raised the question for the FCC to determine how they should think about the different kinds of zero rating. So when I hear Ruslan talk, I think one of the key insights that underlies all of the net neutrality debate is this idea that part of what has made the internet so successful was that it was a neutral open platform where everybody could reach people around the world at low costs. And one of the key visions behind net neutrality rules is this idea that ISP shouldn't um, use their power over users' internet access to pick winners and losers online. And the bright line rules deal with technical forms of picking winners and losers, either just slowing down traffic without fees involved, that's the no throttling rule, or buying a technical advantage for a fee, that's the paid prioritization rule. So the key insight for thinking about zero rating, I think, is to realize that zero rating is just another form of favoring one application over others. So how how is it not uh, what Rosalind was explaining about advertising, right? You know, that you're providing a good and you're subsidizing the cost to a certain extent with advertising. And this is just a different way of applying a similar business offer. I think it's not necessarily a question of why is this not about advertising. It's the idea that the internet is a general platform and we don't want any of the distortions that are being introduced through these kinds of services. And I think one thing that's very important is to really separate out the different kinds of zero rating. So for example, if we think about zero rating, there is no fee, but an ISP zero rates one or more applications in a class of similar applications, like what Comcast is doing with Stream TV, or lots of ISPs in Europe are doing with their own internet video applications or their own cloud storage application. There, this is not about subsidizing access for anybody. This is about giving a competitive advantage to your own application. And that's a key concern for net neutrality proponents. So if we don't want an ISP to give an advantage to its own application by slowing down competing application or speeding up its own application, and in the same way, we don't want an ISP to give an advantage to its own application by exempting it from the bandwidth cap. So that's an example of a form of zero rating that has nothing to do with subsidizing access for users. 
then but they're, the carriers, the wireless carriers, uh, um, it seems like their zero rated plans are providing a benefit to consumers. For example, T-Mobile's binge on. Um, and then, you know, you've got Verizon talking about its, its freebie service, which I believe is also subsidizing the cost of certain applications. Um, those sound like they could be beneficial for consumers. Are there, what are, well, I guess maybe someone, someone on the panel want to tell me like, is, is that a benefit? And then we can talk a little bit about what maybe the cons are. So, I'll be happy to jump in with that question, Maggie. Okay. Oh, but I saw Kevin was going no, no, first. No, Please no. go ahead. No, jump in. That's good. Okay. Go ahead, Jorge. And then we'll okay, like... Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so for us in the Wikimedia Foundation, we believe that zero rating can be useful and beneficial for consumers. Uh, looking and, and considering what the issue is addressed, right? So for us at Wikimedia, we're going against the specific barrier of affordability to access knowledge and information. Zero rating practices, uh, in fact, are not a one size fits all. And as Barbara was describing, there are different ways of doing it. For us, we believe that Wikipedia Zero, which is the zero rating platform that we developed in the Wikimedia Foundation, is a good way of doing it. We designed Wikipedia Zero to address affordability in line with our mission of providing access to knowledge and information. Uh, we believe that there are people in the world that have a barrier to access knowledge. And we designed the program to bring uh, access to this valuable information containing Wikipedia and our Wikimedia sites. And we do so under strict operating principles that guide our zero rating practice. Okay. All right, Kevin, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, no, sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think that um, zero rating definitely can have provide its own uh, benefits under certain circumstances. I think um, that what Barbara was actually trying to say is that there's different categories and you should look at the different issues uh, in a different way, depending upon what issues that are being raised. And I actually think, um, although I might phrase it a little bit differently, I think that's that the FCC, that's what they were trying to do. They did address zero rating, they just didn't have a bright line rule to address it. But they, and that what they were trying to do is say that they would analyze it based upon those individual issues that come up. And I, that allows you to look at the different um, different programs with the different issues that they raise. And even within the different programs, there's going to be arguments both ways. You 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 raise the the um, uh, the cable issue of whether when they're then they're zero rating their own program, they're they're going to argue that their subscribers have already paid for that programming. And that's so there's going to be this argument back and forth within each category um, about it. But there's no question that that certain categories of it I think can be um, beneficial in terms of extending access. Uh, as as Hori was describing, certainly we at Facebook have designed a program that that not only tries to address that the the cost barrier, but of the about four billion people globally who are unconnected, um, actually the, about Half of them, or about two billion of them, it's not only the cost, but actually an awareness of what they would end up doing with the internet. And so we've designed our program to to address in large part that, where you can end up having the opportunity to to test certain basic services uh, and get an opportunity to see what that would end up being like. So and, would you say and, that there are, are certain? I guess, what are the categories then, or is it every program is sort of slightly different? Well, yeah, well, I'm going to let Barbara jump in. I just was going to finish my thought. Hold on, you because oh, sure. you interrupted know, the second, and then I'll let Barbara respond to that. And so, but then within that, within within our program, we we make sure that it's not exclusive to any carrier, not exclusive. Uh, they don't have to be exclusive with our content. Uh, we do it on a on an open, non-discriminatory basis. Who gets to participate? Um, <clears throat> and it's non-commercial in the sense that we don't pay for it, um, and we don't. There's no one who ends up paying either. Either way, users don't pay for their data charges, but neither do neither or do any of the content owners uh, pay for any of the um, uh, any of the zero rating and I think that those are the kinds of factors that that uh, that I think Barbara was saying to go into the different categories to look at um, and you know I think you have buckets the way you describe it I'll, I'll let her yeah, yeah so, so I um, think there are uh, can different... we can we um, is it okay Maggie just to respond to just to, just to clarify um, a few on a few points um, well let's I think let's hear what Barbara says in terms of like where she sees the different categories and then then we'll let you sort of pipe in with, um, with, to clarify. So I think one approach would be sort of more along the lines of what Kevin is saying. We're just using a bunch of factors and then for each individual program, we are looking at the individual factors. I actually think we can identify four different kinds of categories that are somewhat easier to think about. So the first one I already mentioned, there is no fee, but an ISP zero rates one or more applications within a class of similar applications. And Maggie, when you said, oh, that only seems to be a problem in wireline, 
Even in the US, we have programs like Rocket is an ISP, a mobile ISP that zero rates just its own music application. So we see that both in the US and around the world in wireless. Second category, and there I would suggest that is sort of from a net neutrality perspective, just the same problem as picking winners and losers through other kinds of discriminatory practices. So a clear net neutrality violation. Second category, paying a fee. So the application provider pays a fee to be zero rated. That's probably closest to what Ruslan was mentioning because there you might say, well, it's just the application provider subsidizing the costs of their users' internet access. So why do net neutrality proponents think that's a problem? Well. The whole open internet proceeding last year was about the problems we associate with paying for preferential treatment. I'd say that in the same way that it's bad for startup innovation, small businesses, and free speech to pay to be in the fast lane, it creates exactly the same kinds of harm when we are thinking about zero rating. So why do we ban fast lanes online? Because we think, and we know from the proceeding, that startups wouldn't be able to pay to be in the fast lane. Well, they won't be able to pay for zero rating either. Small businesses wrote to the FCC in the thousands and said, you know, we wouldn't be able to pay in the, to pay to pay to be in the fast lane. So they wouldn't be able to pay for zero rating. And all the universities and libraries and nonprofits and faith groups and independent musicians who said the only reason we were able to be successful and we are reaching people around the country and around the world on the same terms as commercial partners, that's because we don't have to pay extra to be, get a competitive advantage or to be able to compete on an equal footing. And so, if they can't pay to be in the fast lane, they can't pay to be zero rated. So you get exactly the same problems for innovation and free speech online. At the same time, you know, you might think it's good for users if they have to pay less, but it turns out there are some very direct harms to consumers from these kinds of zero rating against a fee. And that's, so if in order to motivate companies with money to pay to be zero rated, that gets more attractive the lower bandwidth caps and the more expensive it is to pay for unrestricted bandwidth. That's if we know this from other services, you know, economy class on the plane needs to be sufficiently unattractive to motivate people with money to pay to be in the business class. And I'm not making this up, but we have very tangible evidence from Europe that when ISPs there started to introduce zero rating plans, then they subsequently either reduced bandwidth caps and or increased the price of unrestricted bandwidth. So I, I wanted to jump in here and, and ask you real quick, Barbara. I mean, can, can I address the situation in Europe, please, Maggie? Um, I'm sorry. Maybe can, can I, can I address would... the European situation? Um, you know, I have published some work looking at the um, looking at what's happened in the European situation when uh, bans have been imposed or when zero rating uh, plans have been introduced, I think it's important to keep in mind when you look at the offers in the marketplace, what is actually zero rated is probably less than 1%. So I think it's important to understand this is not, we talk about it being widespread or been around, that's true, um, but in terms of all the um, activities, it's relatively small part. But it's certainly important for a number of, of players. We've uh, talked here with Wikimedia already. But I, I think just, uh, I think what's important to note here, um, yes, it's true when some uh, European, the, let's say a particular a uh, plan was banned, the data cap may have increased, but at the same time, that company reduced its lowest price offer. So, um, because it wasn't possible for them, um, you know, so if you look at where a lot of this started in the United States with Metro PCS, they wanted to create a 4G plan for a low budget consumer. Um, there was a complaint made about this and ultimately the FCC didn't follow up on it. A uh, variety of reasons, but one is it looked like um, FCC was going after the small um, uh, entr uh, broadband providers. I think what's important to note here is who are these kind of zero rating plans important for? First of all, entrant providers. If you have a small network, 
you can't um, differentiate on uh, speed so much. You have to use some kind of form of marketing to get attention. So if you look at around the world, typically the companies using a zero-rated offer of some kind um, would be the fourth or the third or fourth provider. It's important for them to, you know, that's one of the ways they differentiate. And it is important if you look at T-Mobile, they gained 8 million net new customers last year. Um, and for regulators, I think it would be premature for the FCC to start imp providing more guidance on this. They have nine lawsuits pending against them. Five of the lawsuits are from small, uh, small um, broadband providers who are feeling overwhelmed by the regulations. They can't, uh, it costs them too much. There's also an individual who's suing the FCC because he can't buy the kind of service, the FCC regulations prohibit him from buy buying the services he needs to, to do his startup. So I think it's really uh, premature for the FCC to do this. The litigation's still going to go on. It will likely be appealed. So, um, you know, so that would be a, a point for them. Regulators in other countries have also been sued for these kind of activities because they kind of go against uh, countries have free enterprise laws, they have free speech laws, which the zero rating bans actually violate the free speech laws. If if you can if you can believe that. Let um, me let me just ask a question here though, because yeah. I, one of the questions I've had throughout my coverage is is this good for consumers or is it bad? You know, so let's sort of step back from being in Washington, D.C. and thinking only about regulators, you know, how has it harmed, you know, have, I guess, Barbara, have we seen true evidence of harm or is this, we're concerned about a slippery slope? I would say that seeing bandwidth caps reduced when ISPs introduce zero rating, that's a very clear harm to consumers because it means that this stuff, the amount of bandwidth that they can do with whatever they want to do, that declines. I think you can't get a better direct harm. At the same time, this idea of paying to get an advantage, I mean, the harms to startup innovation would ultimately um, hurt all of us because we have less diverse applications available, we can't really take advantage of the diverse set of speakers that are out there. You know, the musicians that became famous because they were able to get to users without having to pay. All of those were great consumer benefits that we have. The problem is, of course, we aren't really in that world yet, and so we can't see the harms that we would have if you had to pay to be in the to be zero right. rated. So is, and there, so, is it fair to say, or, or maybe it's not fair to say in, in your mind, and, and maybe I don't know, Kevin or Jorge want to jump in here? Is it um, are some forms of zero rating potentially beneficial to consumers, while others maybe are not? Like the example that you've given, Barbara, maybe that's not, but maybe you know, T-Mobile is saying they're open to everyone uh, for their binge on and and so forth. And go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, no, so I, I, what I was going to say is I think Barbara was there. She, what she was talking about is the sponsored data model yeah. where, where there's the, the payment model. Um, I, I, I certainly think that there are compo there are programs of, um, of zero rating that do have consumer benefits. And I think that what I was saying before is whether it's factors or whether you have buckets that the FCC lays out, I think an analysis of what's actually going on with each program is appropriate, and the FCC got that component of it right. And I, um, I think for, as an example, like, like I said, with, with ours, it's really designed towards the, the several billion people that aren't aware, and what we're seeing there is that about 50% of the people become full internet users that have never used the internet before um, within 30 days once they try the program. Yeah, let me just stop so you I, real quick, because I yeah. want you to explain what it is that Facebook is doing, because I think this is very sure interesting so so what so what they're doing is they they are working with an operator so that they have an app a separate application that then is provided without data charges to consumers and that application is then open to any um, any uh, other content that wants to participate in it but that there are are, are um, data there are technical limitations that limit the amount of data uh, that the application can utilize so it can't have streaming music it can't have streaming video um, it can't uh, 
um, have uh, high resolution photos. So it's more of a, a text based uh, um, user experience and it gives people access to basic information. Then we work with content owners to make sure that the content is available and meets those technical requirements. We work with an operator to make that application available for free to users and uh, with the design of it uh, of it being able to be utilized in in the developing world even by users with a um, that, that don't even have access to a smartphone so you can access it um, uh, over the web so you can even do it on a 2g phone if you if, if, for with data so that it has no data charges for them and then it it gives them an introduction to the types of information news and services that would be available uh, but, but you guys have seen some some good uptick in usage there we absolutely have. So you've you've had you know millions of people that have tried it as we've rolled this out in 35 different countries around the world, uh, and what we see, as I said, is is a is on an ongoing rolling basis. About half of the users then go on and convert over to being full subscribers, and that, in that sense, Jorge said earlier their program was designed clearly at those who are who 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 cost is the main issue, and this is really designed at that, that combination of awareness and cost. The program is, and and uh, and that's what we, that's what we're trying to to solve and getting people that live with within a, a coverage, a wireless signal available today, um, but that aren't taking advantage of it. Many of them actually have a phone to be doing um, texting and or voice calling, but that don't take advantage of any of the, the things that the internet might offer. And convincing them to try it um, is hard if they have to pay for it, but convincing them to try it um, if they don't it ends up being something that once they do, they can see a lot of those benefits and, and make that conversion. And, and like but I said, some of the criticism, though, of the program is that it sort of provides a curated type of internet for that was who uh, don't have any money, uh, no, right? Uh, that's that, right. And then, and um, that's right. And and one of the strong criticisms was when the program was rolled out originally, um, it wasn't open to any other developer or content. Uh, and so that that was that was one of the criticisms. And the name of the the name of the application in the program at the time was also Internet.org, which which um, furthered the criticism that it was going to confuse people into thinking this was the internet experience. Uh, and so that's why we've tried to address the both of those by both opening it up and um, and changing the name for the consumers. Yes, yeah, so I think a couple of things should be very clear. So the first, what Facebook and Wikipedia are doing is trying to solve a different pro problem than what zero rating program in the U programs in the U.S. are trying to solve. You know, zero rating programs in the U.S. are often designed to increase profits or give themselves a com the, the ISP a competitive advantage. This is different in that they are trying to get more people online, and that's great. Um, and I think the second thing I would say is that Facebook and Wikipedia have both, so Facebook has worked really hard to open up the program to additional providers and try to make the constraints on becoming part of the program as small and technically neutral as possible. So that's all great. I think public interest groups around the world still have concerns about the program because what they are ultimately concerned about is that some people will be stuck in this world where the only internet that they will have access to in the long, medium to long term is the internet provided through free basics. And even though Facebook has lowered the requirements, that shouldn't blind us to the fact that for many local providers and even applications around the world, they won't have the resources to work to adjust their service to the requirements. So over time, free basics will always uh, provide access only to a subset of the internet. And so I think the question that people are grappling with is, is there another way to get people online that would immediately give them access to the full internet and not let some people, the 50% who don't upgrade to the full service, be stuck in this sort of selected internet. There are also some um, privacy and security concerns and concerns about censorship. The problem is that even though Facebook, again, has worked really hard to try to encrypt the traffic, the traffic is unencrypted at Facebook servers and then encrypted again. And there is then sort of a point where you could get access to the data that people are concerned about, you know, where governments or Facebook, even though it has said we won't access that data in general, could 
you know, look at that data and then figure out what people are doing. And people are concerned that Facebook, by being the focal point of this program, might be a good target for government censorship, where they say you shouldn't have this program in in um, free basics. Right. But, so it sounds um, like basically that Facebook would be running the internet essentially in. Yeah, so in a way, they take, for these people who are on free basics, Facebook becomes the gatekeeper, a gatekeeper right. that tries to be very open, but nevertheless a gatekeeper. And so therefore, sort of when you ask public interest groups around the world, they are trying to say, well, why can't, so Facebook doesn't pay, so the ISP pays for the bandwidth. You know, why isn't it an alternative to give users access to a limited amount of data per month that they can use and then immediately experience the full benefits of the internet and then convert to a full subscription. So, so and I, let me just respond quickly and then other panel should be able to, but since it was called out. So two things I would say first, um, first it's it's actually in Facebook's interest that the people have to be able to move on as well. Um, because Facebook in the sense of we're trying to make it non-commercial, um, we actually don't do any advertising on the Facebook site either. So if the people don't move on and they end up staying maintaining just on uh, just on the free version of it, it's, it's not in our interest uh, um, as well from a commercial entity. So uh, that that's not what we want to end up occurring and it won't be successful for us or for the operators if that's where people end up. But the other thing I guess I'd say is that there are, that look, th this is a, it's a complex pro problem when you're talking about how, do you, how you address uh, the digital divide and the billions of people who aren't online and trying to find ways to, to address that problem comprehensively, um, particularly outside of the United States, but even for the digital divide here, but particularly for outside the United States is, is, a, is a challenge and is ones that I think that we've got to be open to trying to have different kind of experiments to, to get on. And especially when there are all kinds of models of zero rating back to Ross uh, Layton's points earlier um, that are that, that have been around and are around all the time in the United States. For example, the Amazon Kindle, you buy an, a low version of the low end version of the Amazon Kindle, and it has access to a curated s set of uh, internet sites. It's not uh, access to the full internet. Uh, so in India, for example, Amazon Kindle gives you access to the Amazon site to order things, but they don't give you access to any other site to order things. They give you access to Wikipedia, but not to not to any other issues. So, and in the United States, it's the same way. So it can't be that we allow it for people who can who can afford to buy a Kindle, but we don't want to allow it for poor, poor people who can't uh, to be able to have it. So, so I think that I think that. Um, that you know, we have all kinds of all kinds of programs that have that have been allowed that that are traditionally allowed. And, um, and, yeah, no, no. I, I want to add here. I think it's important to come back to your question, Maggie. You wanted to know what is a consumer harm, um, and I think there's a there's a real definition of this. It has to do with are consumers paying higher prices, and is there less innovation? And I think the real you know there's a lot of discussion of this could happen. That is discriminatory, whatever. I think you need to really look at the situation and try to quantify these things. So are prices higher? Is there less innovation? Let's look at Ben Joms T-Mobile. You have eight, new, um, 8 million net new customers. Interestingly, the video, this is a new report by P3 uh, that's just come out that looked at Ben John six weeks before and six weeks after. So you've got... Um, uh, something like all of the video sessions are up across the board for not not just for the uh, participants in the binge on, but even for those that are not. Uh, the next thing you have is um, a better uh, optimization of the video distribution, so the uh, user experience has been improved. Um, and you know, T-Mobile has also made a way uh, in, into the marketplace. So, you know, it's it's really hard to argue in this case. Are we having uh, consumers worse off because they're paying less? On the and additionally, you're you're having you know you talk about music freedom, for example. There are as many more people streaming music now. I mean, it's up to the 90th percentile in terms of. Uh, um, you know how many, how much, uh, how many new artists are being discovered and what have you. So um, that is one of the challenges for regulators because when you actually apply these questions about, you know, is it discriminatory? Is it available to all comers? A uh, there's really not an example that I found that a regulator has done a proper assessment. They will engage a lot and say, oh, this could be bad, you know, but there's there's really not names of specific companies. You know, they talk about things in the future that could happen. Well, you know, if it happens in the future, we can address it. We have lots of, there's no shortage of lawyers in Washington. There's no, uh, um, you know, we have instant access information about what goes on. So, um, I think the uh, you know the the point I think you know with with deep respect for Barbara's work she talks a lot about the the architecture of the internet that's driving the innovation 
you know, the far more um, cited explanations of innovation have to do with complementary assets. It's a fancy way to say partnerships. You know, what goes on, look at why, why did Google become this great innovation? They had a fabulous search engine, but they had to marry their search engine with an ad engine. You know, that's why Google can do what it does. It, if it was just the search engine alone, the end-to-end -end principle wouldn't be bringing people to Google. They had to have this complementary uh, asset to bring but things Russell, together. But Russell, what you're describing right now is Barbara, a complementary. I'm sorry, Barbara, before I let you I would, I, would, I would very quickly like to uh, okay. chime in. Okay, go ahead, Jorge. <laughs> Great. So, uh, first of all, like uh, as you were saying, like and for us, we believe that Wikipedia Zero is one of many ways to guarantee access to knowledge resources. Right. We believe that there are uh, very viable models that we have to explore in order to guarantee that people are seeing uh, the consumers are seeing some benefits uh, out of these different platforms. So uh, I just want to clarify something that I think is very relevant for what Roslyn was mentioning about how regulators have been seeing this. Chile uh, in 2014 had a ban on zeroing platforms um, saying that under net neutrality legislation, the offering of free Facebook or free WhatsApp tied to a commercial effort or a commercial offer uh, was not allowed, right? We were able with our program to clarify that for us, Wikipedia Zero was done in a different way by means of which it was not part of that ban. So I think that regulators are understanding the differences and how some zero rating practices can be in fact uh, beneficial for consumers, but at the same time, be aligned with the open internet principles and the open internet frameworks. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, Jorge, but let me just ask him one more question because Jorge hasn't had a, a whole lot of chance to talk here. What are those things that that can be done to ensure that it's a a beneficial zero rating type of plan versus one that maybe um, regulators would have a problem with and, and find harmful to consumers? I think that for us, the approach that the Wikimedia Foundation has taken is an approach in which we are serving our mission from a nonprofit mission driven perspective of trying to guarantee access to information to underserved segments of the world that cannot access this information because of uh, affordability barriers. Under that premise, we were uh, developed, we developed three years ago what we call our operating principles by means of which we guarantee a way in which these zeroing practices are being done responsibly. So for instance, we guarantee that there is no collection of personal information. We tried not to compromise the experience at all. So carriers that zero access to the mobile version of Wikipedia are doing it at the regular access. We ensure that users are not mistakenly incurring data charges. We guarantee that there's no exchange of payment or that there are no exclusive rights or our content. Besides this, we also guarantee that there's no commercial bundling. So for instance, Wikipedia Zero users are not uh, requested to pay for anything or tie this to any commercial offer. We believe that those kind of principles serve our mission and serve our way to do zero rating properly. Okay, so who pays for it though? The, the carrier pays and they're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart? So they yes. keep information? I mean, I think that is both what unites the Wikipedia model and the Facebook model that they do not pay the carrier. They say, we don't want this to be used as a tool for giving one ISP an advantage over other, yes, others. You know, in the beginning, there were often exclusivity arrangements. Both groups have moved away from that. And, um, and then Facebook says, because we are a platform, anybody who meets our technical requirements can be part of it. And these requirements are designed to make the service work well on mobile feature phones and use less bandwidth. And I think those are all sort of, it's still the second best world because it doesn't give you access to the full internet. But in terms of the second best world, I think these are very important principles. Um, but here in the US, we are in a different situation. And there, I can just I, Can wanna... I just ask a question? Would, would you explain to us what would the first best world look like? How would our internet be different if it was perfect in the way you describe it? I'm, I would like to know, like, yeah. how would so... the traffic patterns be different? Would we have different kinds of, you know, would there be like four Googles instead of one? What would be the kind of world that it would look like? I mean, here I was just talking about internet access in developing countries, and I would prefer if those people people who are now coming online for the first time had access to the full internet. And my personal sense is that if the ISP is paying for the bandwidth anyways, 
why not make the bandwidth available unrestricted and then they can still use free basics and know that that will probably allow them to go longer. So that's when I say first best world, I am very concerned about the 50% that Kevin mentions that do not upgrade to full internet access being stuck in this subpar restricted internet because not everybody will ever be able to be part of free basics. Not because but Facebook doesn't These are doesn't companies that, that need to make money. I mean, they're not in yeah. the business. And I mean, so access to everyone right so there they have to make money somewhere so you can't there has to be right i mean that's that's part of well, it. I mean, I'm, maggie, it's interesting maggie when you look what? in chile when whatsapp was zero rated there's it didn't demit there were like eight or nine ten messaging apps that were still extremely popular popular that were not zero rated so it, the argument that with the zero rated one ends up with the lion's share of the traffic or whatever that doesn't necessarily happen so it, I, mean, I guess the question is we still want to know what would why is the world that we have not good enough and you know the interesting thing is you know, whether we like it or not, when you look at the internet traffic patterns, the the traffic kind of goes to the same, there's very popular websites, whether you like it or not. And there, even the fact that there's zero rated doesn't necessarily, um, you know, people are going to go there anyway. So, um, so can I reply to that? Sure. So to, I, first you said, so if someone has to pay for the access, yes, absolutely. And I'm just saying right now in the developing countries, the ISP pays for the traffic both to Wikipedia Zero and to Facebook Free Basics. And so maybe they could use that same investment to give access to unrestricted bandwidth. But moving to the US, yes, absolutely, carriers need to make money, which is part of why the commission is looking at things like reforming the Lifeline program so that the government subsidizes internet access for poorer people who couldn't afford to get access to the internet otherwise. And that will give them access to the full unrestricted internet. So Moving another on, question I have, though, but before we get to, because I feel like we've been kind of... Yeah, hanging. and I also want to talk about sort of the claims regarding Binjan and music freedom, so just to flag that, because we okay. haven't really talked about so that. I, I just want to touch on something that Kevin mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, the Amazon Kindle, for example, is a um, an example of you don't necessarily get full access to the whole internet. You don't get full access to a whole library. It's it's curated to a certain extent. Even here in the U.S., if the service is is somehow reduced, um, why isn't it okay for ISPs to have different business models that appeal to consumers at different price points? If that consumer chooses. Um, to be on something that's a little bit more limited, perhaps? Or do you feel that, that that just puts everyone at a disadvantage? I mean, I think the sort of part of what does not make sense from a user perspective is that the what the ISP does to give you access to limited internet to, or to the full internet, there is no difference. It costs exactly the same amount of bandwidth. And so we see no reason to say, hey, for less money, poor people could get access to a limited internet. You know, we have to realize that people, low income people, minorities are even more dependent on the internet to search for jobs, do their homework, you know, vote, get access to information, educate themselves online. And I just don't think so, that so restricting can, so their can, access makes sense. So can I, when we, when we respond, um, because I think you, you, she wants to talk. I think that um, uh, Barbara wants to talk about the, uh, a few things that we hope we'll get to, to the, some of the T-Mobile programs and also the U.S. Um, and, and there are all kinds of government subsidies subsidies to get people online. You talked about Lifeline and other governments uh, and other countries, and, and I think we're supportive of those kinds of efforts as well. But but there um, but there is a there is a, a difference, and one of the reasons why is particularly for new users who get on. If you give the if you give them a um, uh, unrestricted access, as you were describing, to um, to the internet for even if it's a very little amount of data, um, they'll probably use it up not to do any of those things that you just mentioned, but they could end up just um, watching a very little bit of a video and that's all they would be able to end up doing. So they're not going to end up getting to experience it. And there's a reason why the operators don't want to do that. That's not what they're, that's not what they're uh, wanting to do because they're not seeing it actually work to convert new users over to being paying users. Um, and so I think that they, so, um, so I, I think that there are arguments as to why 
the the you, you don't want to end up doing that because it it actually um, people first of all people getting on don't understand necessarily what um, uh, using a megabit even uh, even necessarily is since they've never been online before so the idea of having a cap for them as opposed to telling them certain kinds of applications or certain services they can use is more confusing and then if it's a very low cap because that would always it would be able to be available for the amount that they're using for things like Wikipedia to be able to be zero rated then that would that would be something that they wouldn't be that that the users would easily use up with the kind of entertainment applications that so are available. So what's your answer to the concern that people will be stuck in this world for a long time? So, so I think the first the, I think the first answer uh, to it is that if if there are four billion folk people online and we're talking about two billion of them that have an awareness gap and if we're able to get a billion of them online without an additional government subsidy I think that's a good thing and uh, so that's the first the first answer and then the second one is uh, we're not saying that this program is an answer for everything but it is an answer for a significant number of them uh, and it's better to do something than to, than I think to do nothing and so I think that the and then the others Certainly, we're supportive of the other kinds of government programs you've mentioned that should end up being available, and uh, and certainly, and, and I think that those to try to end up addressing it. Um, and and you know, we actually see it's interesting what what we see, and this is and uh, in in our data, there's 50 uh, roughly 50 percent of them that move on. Actually, about 40 45 percent of them actually try it and then don't come back at all. Uh, which, uh, like I said, we would like to have the numbers up higher, but we just think it's a still a significantly successful program. But we see about 40, 45 percent that that uh, that try it and don't come back. Uh, and so then, you, so but it is there is this you know five percent of the people that um, uh, f five to ten percent of the people that use it and continue to util uh, to utilize it. I also think that it's important. One of the other components of what we why we think what we do is important is that a lot of times people's income is is, is of great variance, both month to month um, and even week to week. Uh, and having a baseline of connectivity and access to information can be important and can help them utilize it when they do have additional income. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we think that the program is successful. Is that that, that, you, that if people only were able to, to get online when they had uh, enough resources to pay for it then, then they can't utilize it as an ongoing means of communication. And to the extent that, that they, we provide a baseline of communication, that enables them to then you, you know, to pay for additional uh, access to information and additional entertainment sources when they can, but then they are able to have access to an email account all the time uh, to be able to stay online. But okay. I, I want to turn the discussion a little bit toward the regulation. And, and right now, um, you know, uh, you sort of alluded to this already that the, there are no bright line rules in the net neutrality order that uh, explicitly ban this practice. So the FCC is taking, uh, you know, a, an approach that's looking at it case by case, and, and it's already starting to look into this. They've already sent letters to AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, Comcast. Um, First of all, I'm wondering, does anybody here think that Verizon's going to be next on that list? With we have, we didn't even really talk very much at all about their program, but um, you know, does anybody have a sense whether you think that they should be looked at as well? So I think important thing to to mention here um, with the programs in the United States. So you have a binge on, you've got um, the AT and T sponsored data, and you have a Verizon freebie, I believe. And the complaints about these have largely come from advocacy organizations. It's not, you know, consumers going up to the FCC, banging the doors and saying, I don't want these programs. Um, so, um, but in any case, it is going to be very tricky for the FCC to look at this because if they do come out and bring an evidence-based approach, they will, you know, whatever they say is going to be litigated one way or the other. So I think they're even going down the wrong road to start setting up the, the idea that these um, these programs are even harmful and they should instead rely upon, you know, le legitimate complaints brought by consumers where there is people are denied access so they cannot get, um, you know, if, if there's a real case where an internet company can't get the, you know, they can't get the, uh, the, the the access they need, then they should work on that. But you know, the, as as far as we've seen, that's that's not there. Um, just the one quick point, though, to mention, um, there isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you can look on AT&T's website. I think they have something called Success Stories for Sponsored Data, where um, 
uh, companies who wanted to uh, to actually pay for the to pay for people's uh, access. So there were healthcare companies, for example, who are wanting to incentivize their patients and their users to watch health education videos. If you consider the two thirds of a cost of healthcare in the United States is for chronic disease, you can incentivize people to watch videos to stop smoking, um, a variety of things that you know may be a, a good a good use of money that will turn into um, uh, lowered healthcare costs. But the main reason from an operator's perspective is that the more um, customers that they can get on their network, they can, uh, any money that they can earn, for example, let's say NFL, if a company strikes a deal with them, they can use that money to, to do other things. They can invest in their network. They can invest in other capacity that, you know, you don't make anyone worse off. If you're, let's say I'm a baseball fan, say, so NFL gets information that doesn't hurt me, but they will may use that, that revenue to, to invest in other ways that all the users can, can get a, a new product. So, um, so at any rate, there it will be. Um, FCC has a lot on its hands now, and you know you can argue: Are they getting away from the stuff they really need to do because they're so caught up in litigation around open internet? When we need to do spectrum reform, there's universal service, there's um, um, you know a whole other variety of proceedings that aren't happening because so much air is sucked up with this particular discussion. So well, Barbara, I think go ahead. I think it's very important that the FCC looks at this because this is an area that they deliberately left open for further evaluation. And I think the market does need guidance. I expect that because Verizon creates exactly the same programs as other problems as other forms of paying for zero ratings. So Verizon and AT&T sponsored data are basically the same thing that, yes, if they look at sponsored data, they also look at Verizon's program. Um, I did want to come back to uh, the question of T-Mobile's binge on and music freedom program. You know, that's the third category that we haven't talked about, where the ISP says, well, my program is open to all providers in a class. You know, binge on is for online, online video. Uh, music freedom is for music streaming, commercial music streaming. And um, you don't have to pay to be part of it. So these programs do not create the same obvious harms as the first two categories we talked about. You know, you don't have to pay to be part of it, so there is no disadvantage for startups or small businesses, and anybody can be part of it, so at least in theory, the competitive distortion is minimized. Um, the problem is that once you look closer, this is more of sort of a really beautiful vision than the reality. And so if I looked at Binjon, and if you look at the requirements for the program, they are actually really substantial. They govern what kind of protocols you can use, what kind of streaming technology you use, how closely you can integrate text and video. And um, they directly exclude certain applications that use innovative protocols. They discriminate against applications that use encryption. And one key problem is that you know, a lot of providers will have to adjust their programs to work with T-Mobile so that they can fit into their requirements. And you know, that's not just sort of an empty idea. We saw that happening with music freedom. Um, and, and that creates two problems. First, um, it means that if you're a smaller provider, you now have to work with first T-Mobile, but maybe once these programs proliferate with other ISPs around the world to adjust your program to different ISPs. And that's sort of the end of a very important principle, the principle of innovation without permission, that you can get to users around the world and compete on an equal footing without um, making changes to your program. And at the same time, T-Mobile needs to work with you and their resources are limited too. So they need to prioritize among all the providers that want to be part of the program. So if we look at Music Freedom, this program has existed for one and a half years. They grew it from seven to 40 providers. That sounds impressive until you realize that there are more than 2,000 online radio stations in the US. And we check Twitter where users can ask for providers to be included. And then the last three months alone, users asked for 140 music providers that are not part of music freedom. So that means that even one and a half years after the start of the program, 
the program only includes a fraction of the kinds of services that users would like to use. And users still have services that are not included. This is not T-Mobile being evil. This is, this is the result of sort of the way the internet was built. It sounds really great to say we are zero rating all online video. The problem is the network cannot identify all the video and actually getting the identification to work is expensive and requires all these workarounds. And then we can see that with music freedom, at least T-Mobile, at least in part, prioritized working with the larger providers first. So that's a rational business strategy. You know, they polled their users. Google won the first poll. So they tried really hard to get Google into the program fast. But the problem is, while they were focusing on the large providers, a lot of the smaller providers were left hanging. So there are providers who had to wait one and a half years to be included. They who applied in June 2014 when the program launched and then were finally included in December of last year. Other providers, music providers, have applied and never heard back from T-Mobile. So all of this is a long way of saying this sounds really great, but in reality, these, pro these programs do raise significant problems for smaller providers, non-commercial speakers who might not have the resources to adopt their programs to be part of T-Mobile. And then we get to this question where Ruslan keeps saying, you know, oh, there is no problem. Where's the documented harm? Well, the harm is very easy to see. If you look at video, for example, if you are on T-Mobile's lowest qualifying plan, with three gigabyte, you can watch unlimited Netflix, but you can only watch four and a half hours of video per month from providers that are not in binge on. That means you can watch about nine minutes per day from a non binge on provider. That effectively makes it impossible for a video provider to compete because if you want to watch a video on your daily commute, you can only do that with a binge on provider. So that is a real distortion in competition. And then finally, from the perspective of the user, I would say, well, I can see that T-Mobile that is trying to do something innovative. But if their, if their network can tolerate all this additional video traffic, and it would be a lot better for me to use that for other stuff, why not open up the zero rating program to any any service that is rate limited to 1.5 megabits per second. So there would be ways of offering the program for T-Mobile that say, well, you get your high speed allotment up to three gigabyte or up to six gigabyte at 4G LTE speeds, but then you can switch to a zero rated mode that is rate limited and everything you do in that mode is zero rated. But with that kind of system, you don't run into any of these problems of you don't need to admit pro, uh, providers to the program. They don't need to make changes. And so users continue to choose what they want to do online. And I think, Maggie, Barbara, um, yeah. may, may I interject? Um, since I'm in the room, can I help? I, I don't need to cut you off. Um, actually, I do. <laughs> Sorry. I totally meant to cut you off. I apologize. Um, Maybe we're, we're wrapping things up, Maggie. I want to let you close, but um, I just wanted to see if anybody in the audience here um, might want to ask a question or two um, before we have to wrap things up. Um, any, any questions from the audience? Alexander Howard in the back. Yeah, uh, so two questions. Which I'll give you the microphone for. Uh, sure, Alex Howard. Consumer focused. What about the argument that, um, as you just brought up with video in this particular context of a telecom company, zero rated uh, uh, incumbents um, in a given country, um, if they're offered the, that free service, why would consumers switch to someone else they'd have to pay for? Doesn't that give a, an advantage to incumbents, um, including, in fact, uh, social networking? That's a concern with, say, Facebook. Could be brought to Google as well for search engines. Wouldn't that make it difficult for domestic or other companies to compete with those that are zero rated? Um, and then the, well, let's just leave it with that. Okay. I, I want to give you an interesting example. It's the Netherlands where you had, um, um, there was a deal with the incumbent, made a deal with uh, HBO Go. And HBO Go actually never had, they didn't have any success with it. It was zero rated, um, you know, a well-known brand name. 
And uh, the interesting thing is the Dutch uh, the regulator ended up fining Vodafone for offering that, you know, 200,000 euros. It's more than the money they ever made on the program get, and getting any new subscribers. So, uh, I mean, it, it's an interesting case. That just because you zero rate something doesn't mean you're going to win market share. It doesn't mean the app will even um, go anywhere. So yeah, but it, 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 it sort of goes against, you know, the, the, uh, the conventional wisdom that just because you make something free, you know, very frequently operators are not doing this uh, because they want to, but because they have to. I mean, there, there's, and the interesting thing is since the um, net neutrality rules have come into place in the Netherlands, you see fewer Dutch content providers. You actually see a much greater proportion into the, the number of content providers on the, the uh, in the app um, and the app world has declined um, because no no content provider even wants to do anything in the Netherlands because they're also afraid of being dinged by the regulator. It's not just telecom operators who are afraid. Well, I would like to see that. that I well, <laughs> um, so Alex, I think you are totally right that if an ISP zero rates its own service, that gives a competitive advantage or whatever service is being zero rated gets a competitive advantage, and that is a problem. And contrary to what Ruslan says, I do think we have a lot of evidence that users strongly react to zero rating. You know, Slate did an experiment where they offered the same podcast to some users in a zero rated form and to others with it counting against the cap. And the people who were offered the zero rated podcast were 61% more likely to click on the link. Of course, people prefer content that doesn't count against the cap. You know, I I just gave you this example of Binge, and we have a lot of other examples from from Europe where the ISP zero rates their own clouds, cloud storage application. If you want to use a competing one, you have to pay 50 to $80 in overage fees to upload the same amount of money. That is effectively making competition impossible. Same and I, can, oh, yeah, and you know, I just... think the final thing to your question about the local providers, yes, I do believe that even if they don't um, zero rate their own uh, provider, uh, their own application, like the top three social messaging application, that that does raise the limits or the hurdles for local content because you know, the, the content that is zero rated and most popular is probably be the American multinational content. And if you have to compete with free, it is harder to compete. No, I, I was just going to say that I think that, that certainly we try to end up addressing it by having a, a platform that's open so that the other actually um, a, a social network or a new one would be able to take advantage of the open platform as well. So they could end up being zero rated as well. Um, and so, and I actually just want to go back to one of the things I said earlier. I think it's for the, as you can tell by the debate here, there's so many complications, so many permutations. If you're going to do anything other than just flat out ban it, which Barbara, I don't think we've, I don't think we've hit upon a zero rating scheme that she might like. Uh, we did. I no. just described. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I wasn't sure I got it. The, um, but, um, but, uh, but, but, no matter what, I think that the the commission um, finding a way to address it on a case by case is probably the. I, I think that probably is what uh, was a wise move for them on their point. Well, I'm gonna uh, forgive me. Forgive me for. I'm gonna hand it back to Maggie in just a second. Uh, before I do, Maggie Mag will close up uh, the panel. But I wanted to, as, as we get done. Um, we, for the hundreds of people that are watching the live stream um, at, in their homes, I can't buy them drinks. But um, for everybody else that's here, we have a reception just down the hall. Uh, for everybody that you know came out today with their snow boots on, we appreciate this. this is a fascinating panel. So once we get done with this and, and Maggie wraps it up, um, please uh, join us down the hallway for, for a cocktail reception. I really appreciate it. Maggie, can you wrap us up, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I, I just want to thank everybody who joined us, You know, the folks who were there in the room and all the panelists who were able to get there, and Jorge for um, joining us from sunny Mexico. He's the lucky one. Um, and, you know, just thank you all again. This was a great discussion, and uh, I, I really appreciate everybody um, joining and, and making this a really lively discussion. So everybody, enjoy your drinks. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, hopefully next year I can be there if it doesn't snow. <laughs>